the unit. Yeah, we'll have two final culminating assignments, Shakti. And don't worry, Nikki, uh, if it says that it's missing, um, it just means that you submitted it through the Google form and uh, with regards to that. So we'll, uh, and yeah, so you should still have a mark. It should still be there if you submitted the Google form. Um, but you had to actually submit the Google form in order for it to show up. Okay, so let's start with lesson nine, the cell membrane. And we're gonna look at the aspects of how the cellular membrane kind of controls movement in and out of the cell. And this is kind of that big thing that I was talking about yesterday with regards to that phospholipid bilayer and talking about the general concept of uh, all of the things that we've basically been learning and focusing on the last couple of days. So recall that, that eukaryotic cells, they have that membrane bound organelles and most importantly, they have that plasma membrane that kind of holds all of those organelles inside of that cell and that cytoplasm. And, and it's very important to recognize this because at the end of the day, um, eukaryotic cells evolve from prokaryotic cells. And that, that infolding and endosymbiosis that you learned about last year in grade 11, which created those internal membranes like the endoplasmic reticulum, the nuclear membrane, the chloroplast mitochondria, all of that, all of that allows for that cell to function. Without that internal membrane, without that, um, without that phospholipid bilayer of that cellular external membrane, none of what we're studying would be possible because the separation from that extracellular fluid from the cytopl uh, cytoplasm or the cytosol is what allows for that control of in and out movement for cells to actually participate in many of the functions that they need to do. So when we look at that model uh, that is on the left here, that uh, diagram, if you will, uh, it's very important to recognize that these membranes are fluid and they are not rigid, okay? Their molecules are, are, are not locked in place. They're fluid, they move as they need to. Anytime the cells are going to be performing any functions, uh, you really de definitely need to know how those functions work and, and the organelles that are responsible for that. So it's important to recognize that the membrane is kind of like the gate for all of those cellular organelles. Uh, these membranes consist of lipids and are embedded uh, with proteins, which are able to freely move in a lateral direction along that cellular membrane. Uh, they cannot flip and invert, much like we talked about that yesterday. Someone asked the question of, can those phospholipid bilayers flip and invert? No, uh, same thing goes for those proteins that are in those phospholipid bilayers, but they can kind of shuttle around and move, um, but they cannot flip. It's important to recognize that the, the mosaic um, pattern or whatever you want to call it in terms of that mosaic structure, uh, it's important to recognize that there are many different proteins all of which have a unique function. The cellular membrane isn't just this one static thing that has one thing that does everything. It's got hundreds of thousands of individual little proteins and groups of proteins and, and cholesterols and lipids and different types of, uh, uh, of fats and aminos that kind of contribute to the overall structure of that cellular membrane or that cell membrane. So when we talk about the fluid mosaic model, we're just talking about the fact that that cellular membrane is not rigid and it can move and it's made up of many different proteins. So those are the two main things that you need to know with regards to that fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. So notice that the internal and external sides of the membrane are asymmetrical, meaning that there is going to be different uh, it's going to contain different components needed for cell function on the inside versus what you would see on the outside. That external cellular fluid or that ECF, as I call it up here, that external cellular fluid, it doesn't have the same things that the cellular membrane or that cytosol has. So it's important to recognize that they're asymmetrical. There's going to be a different thing on the inside of that cell versus the outside of the cell, which you kind of already knew because you know that there's going to be all those different organelles, you know that there's going to be all those different proteins and how they function and move. So let's take a look at the components of those cellular membranes because that is really the most important aspect. Again, yesterday we looked at phospholipids as a means to understand how that cellular membrane can form. And it's from that phospholipid bilayer, which is essential for that membrane function, and that 
key component here is that it's amphiphatic, right? Meaning that they orient themselves in that hydrophilic polar regions towards the aqueous solution, whether it's that extracellular fluid uh, on the outside of the cell or that cellular uh, cytoplasm or that cytosol on the inside, because at the end of the day, it needs to have that hydrophobic or that non-polar region pointing towards the interior of the membrane. So again, the head groups orient themselves towards water, the tails orient themselves away from water. And, and I cannot stress, I cannot stress folks how important this is because throughout the rest of this class, as we learn all about how cells communicate with each other, as we learn about how cells transport things in and out, as we learn about how they get certain functions completed, it all has to do with that beautiful, beautiful concept that the phospholipid bilayer allows for that separation of water on the outside to the separation of water from the inside of that cell. So it can create that concentration gradient. And, and again, we'll get into that aspect more as we move. But again, remember hydrophobic, those non-polar regions, they point towards the inside of that membrane. And then the hydrophilic or polar regions point towards the outside towards water or whatever aqueous solution it is in. Okay, the next aspect as a component of cellular membranes is carbohydrates. So you might be thinking to yourself, holy smokes, why are carbohydrates there? Well, they are going to attach to those lipids and proteins on the membrane to form what's called a glycolipid or a glycoprotein. These are going to be always on the exterior membrane and they perform certain functions. They help with cellular recognition. For example, they help recognize the cell as it, it is itself or as an invading cell. So there are several diseases um, one of which is lupus, where these glycoproteins or those glycolipids for specific cell types don't get made properly. And whether it's as a result of genetic factors or environmental factors, we're not 100% sure either way, but those glycolipids or glycoproteins, which help identify that cell that it's attached to as a, a self cell, they don't get made properly. So then the immune system says, oh, that cell, it doesn't have these glycoproteins or glycolipids. It must be an invading cell. But in reality, it's a skin cell or a liver cell or what have you that just didn't make those glycolipids or glycoproteins properly. So it can cause some issues if those glycopro uh, glycoproteins or glycolipids don't get made correctly or they get damaged because, again, it helps with that cellular recognition. So that's the two components of the cell membrane. The third component of the cell membrane is cholesterol. Uh, it is not necessarily the same type of cholesterol you'd be thinking about in terms of uh, a healthy versus unhealthy diet. But the key thing here is that you have to understand that the fluidity of the membrane really depends on how tightly packed together those lipids are. Uh, if they're too tightly packed together, they can't move. They're too rigid. And you want that fluid membrane to be as fluid as possible. So it can be flexible and it allows for it to take on all sorts of different tensile strengths. Uh, so that fluidity is determined by two main factors. The ability for those things to move within the membrane uh, is entirely dependent on the composition of lipids as well as temperature. So let's look at composition of lipids first. So saturated chains packed tightly together are going to make it less fluid. Unsaturated, chain, unsaturated chains packed uh, or have these bends or that decrease in that van der Waal forces and that allows for that to have more fluid function. So there is going to be times where you need that less fluid, tightly packed together, uh, saturated chain, but at sometimes you don't need all, you don't always need that tightly packed together nature. So those unsaturated chains have those bends, which decrease those van der Waal forces, which allow it to be more fluid. And then the last thing you need to recognize with regards to the composition of the lipids is that that hydrocarbon chain, the longer chain it is, the longer the chain is, the less fluid it will be. So all three of these factors, one, two, and three, contribute to how fluid that cellular membrane is. If there's lots of saturated chains packed tightly together, it's going to be less fluid. If there's lots of unsaturated chains, which have those low van der Waal forces, it's going to be more fluid. And if it's super long hydrocarbon chain, then those uh, cellular membranes are going to be less fluid. And again, it's not going to be one or the other for those three compositions. It's going to have in some way, shape or form, lots of different aspects of it. So some, some of cells will have way more saturated chains. Some cells will have way more unsaturated chains. Some cells will have longer hydrocarbon chains for that uh, phospholipid bilayer. It really is a combination of those three factors, but they all contribute 
to how fluid that membrane is. The other more important factor I would say, um, because it doesn't, it does change and it can vary quite often is temperature. Uh, and temperature is so important because the higher temperatures increase fluidity of a membrane. Uh, so again, thinking back to yesterday when we looked at proteins and when we looked at enzymes, high temperatures not only denature proteins and denature enzymes, they also contribute to the fluidity of those cellular membranes within uh, any living organism. So if it's too warm and those fluid membranes are too uh, fluid and they're, they're, they're not as packed tightly together, the key thing here is that uh, it's going to affect the structure of that cellular membrane. Um, so why doesn't the hydrophilic part that's exposed to water dissolve? Because it's hydrophilic but insoluble, right? Regards to that solubility aspect, it, hydrophilic doesn't necessarily mean insoluble. Insoluble doesn't necessarily mean hydrophilic. It just has to do with the ionic structure as well. Okay, cholesterol acting as a membrane. So what does cholesterol do? Well, it, stabil it stabilizes. So cholesterol acts as a membrane stabilizer. It helps to increase the or decrease the fluidity depending on the temperature. So when temperature increases or decreases, cholesterol maintains the same fluidity of the membrane. And it is only found in animals. So that's part of the reason why uh, having those healthy fats and, and some cholesterol is very important for cellular membrane health. Because even though that temperature fluctuates, cholesterol stays pretty stable in terms of its fluidity. So it helps to maintain the stability of that cellular membrane. And the cholesterol molecule has that, hydro, um, that hydrophilic head again, and it's got that hydrophobic tail, but it has two components of that hydrophobic tail, one of which is those uh, hexagonal hydrocarbon chains. And you won't really have to know that too much, but just recognize that that cholesterol acts as a membrane stabilizer. Okay, the, one of the last things we're gonna talk about with regards to, oops, with regards to membrane um, structure is membrane proteins. And they can belong to one of two categories. They can be what's called peripheral or they can be integral membrane proteins. Uh, the key things here with regards to that is that peripheral proteins sit on the surface of that cellular membrane and they don't go through it. So they're hydrophilic, meaning that they're more than happy to stay in water, they won't uh, react with it too differently. Sheaths won't form around it. They won't dissolve in, um, in that water. So they quite like being in water and that's why they are peripheral proteins. They don't ever go through the membrane because they are hydrophilic. And they are also comprised of amino acids. So I'll just highlight that there for your convenience. And the last thing here uh, with regards to the membrane proteins, uh, the integral or transmembrane proteins. These guys are going to be in the membrane or fit through the membrane from one side to the other. So they interact directly with the extracellular fluid as well as the cytoplasm. Uh, these are going to have all types of amino acids depending on the section that they are found in and depending on the function that they need to perform. As we look at active and passive transport throughout this day, you'll start to see how these integral or transmembrane proteins are so important because they are responsible for moving things in and out of the cell. So when we look at this diagram here to recognize the different functions of membrane proteins, uh, it's important that we recognize that they're found in varying combinations. It's not just one protein in one cell. Uh, they are in all cells. Some have higher concentrations of different membrane proteins. It really depends on the function of the cell. So again, here's the, the key thing with regards to the cellular membrane transport. The idea that these proteins help to move things in and out of the cells or recognize things that are from outside of the cells and then they perform a function as a result. They also help with regards to the fluidity um, or they need to be uh, in a cellular membrane that are fluid because they do move around and shuffle along the cell membrane. Uh, and I have some four examples here. They are responsible for transport, which we will look at soon. They are responsible for enzymatic activity. They can help catalyze things. They're helpful in responding to uh, hormones or messengers that other cells will send to that specific cell. And they're also very responsible for helping form structure and recognition. That extracellular fluid has a lot going on and it needs to be able to communicate within the cell sometimes. So at the end of the day, there are several different factors that contribute to the cell's function as a result of these integral or transmembrane proteins. Okay, folks, that's it for this lesson. It is a it's a lot to take in from like a big picture, 
but content wise, it's not too bad. Uh, there's some homework section pages there on page 86 for you to take a look at. There's quite a bit of questions for you to do with regards to this lesson. I would encourage you to read through section 2.2 first before you answer some of these questions. I'm building in some time for you to look through it uh, because I find it, I think it will be important for you to combine everything that we've learned from the last few days into how this cellular membrane uh, couple of lessons are going to work because it will require you to have that knowledge and understanding of the functional groups and how phospholipids work and how carbohydrates work. So it's quite important that you read through that section and answer those questions, as well as take this time now, once you finish that, uh, to also take a look at your assignment. So I'll be in here until uh, break answering questions. Uh, so please do so if you have them. <laughs>